Is it rolling, Bob? Is it rolling, Bob? Is it rolling, Bob? Hi, folks. It's Chris Gregory here again, and welcome to season four of Bob Dylan, A Head Full of Ideas. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about Gates of Eden, a um, song from 1965, Bringing It All Back Home. And uh, this one's subtitled, A Crashing But Meaningless Blow. So I'm going to start with a couple of quotes. First of all, this is from um, William Blake's The Gates of Paradise. Mutual forgiveness of each vice, such are the gates of paradise. And this is from um, Arthur Rambo, A Season in Hell. Once, if I remember rightly, my life was a feast where all hearts opened and all wines flowed. One evening I sat beauty on my knees and I found her bitter and I reviled her. I armed myself against justice. I fled. Oh, sorceresses. Oh, misery. Oh, hatred. It was to you my treasure was entrusted. I managed to erase all human hope from my mind. I made the wild beast silent leap to strangle every joy. I summoned executioners to bite their gun butts as I died. I summoned plagues to stifle myself with sand and blood. Misfortune was my god. I stretched out in the mud. I dried myself in the breezes of crime. And I played some fine tricks on madness. And spring brought me the dreadful laugh of the idiot. Yes, Arthur Rambo wrote that when he was about 17. Um, yeah, quite a teenager, I think. Um, finally, as Bob Dylan says before introducing Gates of Eden at New York Philharmonic Hall, 31st of October, 1964, the famous Halloween concert, he says, this is called a sacrilegious lullaby in D major. And uh, he giggles a lot, yes. Gates of Eden is arguably the song in which Bob Dylan takes his interest in symbolist poetry to the most extreme level. Its collocation of dream imagery is often bizarre and sometimes impenetrable. Under the spell of symbolist poets like Rambo and Baudelaire, he appears to be luxuriating in the joy of pure imagery. As with Mr. Tambourine Man, the influence of the psychedelic experience also strongly informs the song. A couple of years later, this kind of culture would enter the popular consciousness through many popular hit singles and albums. But unlike, say, Hurdy Gurdy Man by Donovan, Flowers in the Rain by The Move, Hole in My Shoe by Traffic, or The Beatles' Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, Gates of Eden is no hippy-dippy fantasy. It delivers its philosophical message in an uncompromisingly harsh tone, almost in the manner of an admonitory sermon. The song consists of nine four-line verses, all delivered in a rather sinister tone. Most of the verses use three rhyming endings, followed by the non-rhyme title phrase, which is made particularly dramatic by this effect. Dylan's delivery is harsh and uncompromising. There's an interesting contrast in cover versions by Brian Ferry and Ralph McTell, both of whom approach the song with a kind of hushed awe. The song's attractive melody is brought out in these versions, and more specifically, in an instrumental reading by the Moore Trio. That's a strange concept, isn't it? Instrumental version of Gates of Eden. Anyway, Dylan himself has usually stuck to the original acoustic arrangement in his many live takes on the song, although he did briefly try an interesting rock version in 1988 at the beginning of the never-ending tour. But the song is usually stripped to its mere musical bones in Dylan's performances, thus placing emphasis on both the fantastical imagery and the philosophical points Dylan is making. It's important to place Gates of Eden in its historical context. In 1965-6, to six, the shadow of the Cuban Missile Crisis still fell over a world which had trembled at its implications. In A Hard Rains Are Gonna Fall, Dylan had produced a direct and extremely vivid picture of the horrific cataclysm that the world was then facing. By now, however, the responses to humanity being on the edge of destruction tended to try to identify the socio-political mentality that had brought about the crisis. 
The conclusion that many young people in the 1960s reached was that the apparently bland surface of official culture concealed insane ideologies that threatened the entire human race. Therefore, it seemed that breaking down all existing social conventions was now necessary. For this confused and angry generation, the lyrics of songs like Gates of Eden, despite displaying irrational logic and extraordinary juxtapositions, made more sense than the speeches of Lyndon Johnson, Barry Goldwater or Richard Nixon. Here, as with other contemporary songs like It's Alright Ma, I'm Only Bleeding, Tombstone Blues, Bob Dylan's 115th Dream and On the Road Again, Dylan mixes surreal and apocalyptic images with an implied critique of the dullness and the conventionality of American society. As Dylan delivers it, Gates of Eden is an angry song. Despite its apparently weird irrationality, it expresses the confusion of the post-missile crisis world with great eloquence. The opening line immediately introduces us into its dream logic. Dylan begins by spitting out, of war and peace, the truth just twists. The rather ungrammatical statement takes us by surprise, but it's not only grammatical sense that is broken down in the song's post-lapsarian dream world. The singer is on a mission to redefine the nature of truth itself, a truly philosophical enterprise. The line ends, it's curfew girl, it glides. Well, this is a bit puzzling. Does it refer to the notion of the truth presented here? And what on earth is a curfew goal? <laughs> the word curfew suggests a repressive society and birds certainly do settle down at night as if they are obeying a curfew. The phrase seems to indicate that Dylan has been experimented with automatic writing, a technique beloved of the beat poets intended to produce juxtapositions of words from the subconscious. Perhaps Dylan is suggesting that the populations which might be flying free have a curfew of darkness or ignorance imposed on them. But this kind of language does not actually invite definitive interpretations. So it's up to you. <laughs> Write to me, get back in touch, give me some comments. What is a curfew goal? It'll be interesting to see what um, reactions we can get to this. Uh, most listeners, however, will gloss over the line as the imagery in the next two lines is so powerfully and brilliantly visual. And here it goes. Upon four-legged forest clouds, the cowboy angel rides with his candle lit into the sun, though its glow is waxed in black. The outlandish four-legged forest clouds paints a surreal picture of a world in which nature itself has been turned upside down as if the clouds have taken on the shape of a great threatening beast. This recalls the nightmarish image of nuclear mushroom clouds looming overhead. The figure of the cowboy angel recalls out of the hilarious character Major Kong in Stanley Kubrick's devastating anti-nuclear satire Dr. Strangelove, released in 1964, the year Gates of Eden was composed. It goes down with the bomb that will trigger Armageddon. The image that follows of a candle lit into the sun seems strangely pointless. The brilliantly suggestive, its glow is waxed in black, may suggest that the sun itself is blackened and dead. The use of waxed is particularly clever as the term refers both to one of the phases of the moon and to the making of candles. Yet we are then told that the picture of the distorted world does not apply. Neath the trees of Eden... Dylan thus immediately sets up the notion of Eden as being in opposition to the dystopian scenario he has created. Eden, of course, refers to the Garden of Eden, the mythological location where, according to Genesis, Adam and Eve began the procreation of the human race. According to Judeo-Christian tradition, it was in Eden that the fall of man into sinful ways began. In his great epic poem Paradise Lost, John Milton describes this process in intimate detail. The notion of Eden has been expanded over the centuries to describe a wonderful or paradisical location or a blissful state of mind. It seems that Dylan is now focusing on the notion of Eden as a place of innocence, a kind of utopia which is simultaneously an individual state of idyllic harmony and delight. The hippie generation that followed in Dylan's wake 
may be said to have been reaching out towards this ideal state. As Joni Mitchell sang in her celebration of Woodstock, the most public manifestation of countercultural ideals, we are stardust, we are golden, we've got to get ourselves back to the garden. More surreal images then follow in quick succession. We hear that the lamppost arms, its iron claws attached to curbs neath holes where babies wail, though its shadows metal badge. This scenario can be interpreted in a number of ways. Grammatical and logical sense seems to have broken down. We appear to be in some kind of nightmare in which mechanical objects have come alive in a very threatening manner. A world on the edge of losing all meaning, perhaps. This is emphasised by the ominous denouement with its powerful internal rhymes, all in all, can only fall with a crashing but meaningless blow. No sound ever comes from the gates of Eden. You don't really get more portentous than that, do you? Meaninglessness, it seems, is the ultimate potential terror. After the coming apocalypse, no one will be left to make moral judgments. They will, in fact, be irrelevant. Eden itself will be empty. In the next four verses, we meet representatives of military, religious and political hierarchies, all of whom are out of their depth as they fail to deal with a world spinning out of control. There is a savage soldier, a representation of the military who, rather than dealing with any existing problems, just sticks his head in sound and then complains and to the shoeless hunter who's gone deaf. In a wonderfully funny lampoon of religious and mystical fakery, we see Aladdin and his lamp who sits with utopian hermit monks, side saddle on the golden calf. The surreal reference to riding side saddle depicts these bizarre devotees as if they are figures from a crazy psychedelic western. The political establishment, personified as relationships of ownership, are condemned to act accordingly and wait for succeeding kings. In each case, these sadly deluded and confused figures are brought down to earth by the harsh reality that the singer keeps emphasising. Dylan licks his lips around the deliciously alliterative Upon the beach where hound dogs bay at ships with tattooed sails heading for the gates of Eden. Can't you just repeat that over and over to yourself? I'll do it again. Upon the beach where hound dogs bay at ships with tattooed sails heading for the gates of Eden. Magnificent. He concludes that the promises of paradise that Aladdin and his gang have made are laughable. Ironically, the one mocking laugh will come from the place where political positions are meaningless. There are no kings inside the gates of Eden. In some wonderfully funny lines, Dylan encapsulates the paranoia of the straight world in the face of the burgeoning counterculture. The motorcycle black Madonna, two-wheeled gypsy queen, he sings, delighting in the accumulated adjectival nouns, and her silver-studded phantom caused the great flannel dwarf to scream. The grey flannel dwarf, whose reduced stature is, we may assume, more mental than physical, is a stereotype representation of a conformist, clearly a relation of Mr Jones from next year's Ballad of a Thin Man. The dwarf is then seen to pay obeisance to the wicked birds of prey who pick up on his breadcrumb sins. The suggestion seems to be that such representatives of the establishment are consumed by religious guilt. However, Dylan concludes in no uncertain terms that the feeding of breadcrumbs is essentially a waste of time, as there are no sins inside the gates of Eden. This final line presages the philosophical conclusions that now come to dominate the song, perhaps most effectively in the seventh verse, which begins with a strong suggestion of corruption. The kingdoms of experience and the precious winds they rot, which is followed by a beautifully balanced expression of pointlessness. While paupers change possessions, each one wishing for what the other has got. Meanwhile, the princess and the prince discuss what's real and what is not. But philosophy itself is futile as it doesn't matter inside the gates of Eden. In the following verse, this sense of futility is taken to the logical extreme. We are told that friends and other strangers from their fates try to resign. Another pointless strategy, as one cannot resign from one's own fate, Dylan follows this by what is perhaps the song's most devastating indictment of the inaction of the rulers of the world, 
in the face of impending cataclysm. Leaving men wholly totally free, he sings, building up the emphasis with the harsh staccato double positive to do anything they wish to do but die, as if they are trapped in some horrific version of purgatory. Finally, he reminds us that there are no trials inside the gates of Eden. Dylan's Eden is far removed from the judgmental notions of heaven, hell, and the afterlife that dominate much Judeo-Christian theology. It appears to represent a place of spiritual truth where there are no trials, but natural justice reigns. In the final verse, the singer's lover comes to him and reveals that all of this was a dream. She makes no attempt to analyse the plethora of images we have been presented with, concluding that at times I think there are no words but these to tell what's true, and there are no truths outside the gates of Eden. Thus the cowboy angel, the lamppost with the folded arms, the savage soldier, the gang of utopian monks, the black Madonna motorcyclist, and the grey flannel dwarf are all fragments of her fevered imagination as her mind wrestles with matters of conscience, sin, and justice. Gates of Eden is certainly one of Bob Dylan's most inscrutable songs. In many ways, it's an experimental piece. It throws many distinctive images at us, not necessarily in any logical order. Sounded like Eric Markham here, didn't I? In other songs, the imagery would be more ordered and consistent. The musical presentation of such songs would be um, often more attractive. But here, he conveys the illogic of a dream very effectively, while emphasising the philosophical point that in the face of political and social corruption and with the human race facing potential destruction, the only rational stance to take is one which abandons the twisted logic of a world in crisis in favour of a return to a place of innocence and purity. Only in this way, it seems, by dispensing with conventional notions of rationality, can the seeker after spiritual truth come to terms with the essentially illogical nature of modern life. So there it is, Gates of Eden. It's uh, not exactly a uh, catchy pop song, is it? But uh, I do, do really hope you've um, enjoyed this. Um, do have a look at my website, and I'll be uh, back again soon with episode three of Bob Dylan, A Head Full of Ideas. See you then. Bye-bye. Is it rolling, Bob? Is it rolling, Bob? Is it rolling, Bob?